Students of Egyptian mythology and art history have never underestimated the role of the sun in the religious devotions and cosmological purview of Nilotic societies. Going by the name of Ra, or Aten, Egypt's solar orb was deemed both a primordial and an eternal power that established and maintained a cosmic principle called Mat, the term meaning truth. Born out of chaos, Mat is described in hieroglyphic records as both a cause and an effect of the gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, and was said to arise from the chaotic and lifeless waters of the Nile River during the advent of the sun god's creation of life. Mat is not just a principle, but also a goddess of cosmic or natural order. She is seen here at the bow of Egypt's sunboat, leading the way to the Nile's western shores of bliss, with a single ostrich plume carried upon her head, this being the symbol of Mat itself. In this intimate family portrait of the pharaoh Akhenaten, his queen Nefertiti, and their royal children, around 3,400 years ago. We note how the sun's rays bring the breath of life to Egyptian royalty by extending the Egyptian symbol of eternal life, the Ankh sign, or handled cross motif, directly to the noses of the king and queen. The mythic relations between the Egyptian sun and the living world is somewhat paradoxical because beyond the shores of the Nile, the desert sun of Egypt is nothing but lethal. A person can feel it day in and day out. Nevertheless, solar cycles do set a schedule for the rhythms of life everywhere and are therefore associated with Egyptian symbols that relate to living creation and to natural order. An illustration from a burial text known as the Book of the Dead depicts here a connection between a symbolic phallus known as the Jed symbol and an Ankh motif, whose two accessory arms actually sustain the sun. While this image seems to reverse the natural order of the world by implying that Life itself is the sustainer of the sun, an otherwise inanimate object of the sky, not vice versa as would be our current biological perspectives. Such are the many mysteries of Egyptian theology and symbolism. Either way, Mat is the name of a principle that underpins cosmic order and no less defines the roles of gods and goddesses in Egypt's richly populated pantheons. Egyptian symbolism and mythology is a tricky subject for historians because art specialists and mythologists usually aim to define a specific god or goddess in exacting terms, based usually on their standard physical attributes and specific mythical roles. Written and iconographic records of ancient Egypt do not readily lend themselves, however, to these ends. Because most symbols, and there are many, relate in one way or another to various members of a pantheon. And likewise, most mythic roles that dis typically distinguish this or that deity are shared or borrowed by any number of closely related mythical associates. So surprisingly, despite a rich and well-preserved historical record, Egyptologists are still uncertain as to what specifically the Egyptians believed and expressed in their very inconsistent means and modes of religious expression and symbolism. Let's compare, for example, this particular image of two goddesses, worshiping a sun with uplifted hands, a cosmic phallus and an Ankh sign, to a similar scene that presents a symbolic phallus and sun in a decidedly different context. 
Here the jet column supports a sun disk as it plies the waters of the Nile River in a crescent-shaped solar barge. Two baboons take the place of the goddesses here, but pay obeisance to the phallic symbol in the exact same manner with uplifted hands. In mythology, this image relates to the theme of the sun's primeval birth from the abyssal waters of the Nile. Rather than placing the solar orb in its ex expected position in an Egyptian sky. Yet another permutation on these standard symbolic themes replaces the solar disk with the bust of a goddess known as Hathor, who, with her cow ears, is often associated with a divine, lactating cow that lives in the waters of the Nile. But here the phallus seems to belong to reply to, paradoxically, a female deity. While her discoid collar is stylistically perhaps indicative of a solar motif, all of the symbolic signs in this configuration are living elements, which do not exactly pertain to the sky. The goddess Hathor shares many mythic and symbolic attributes with a close female associate, who also takes the form of a bovine goddess at times, but who, when fully anthropomorphized, assumes the image of a lactating mother of a sun god known as Horus Ra. She lacks cow ears, but she does have cow horns, inside which she carries a solar disk, which identifies her with the sun, or at least as a supporter of the sun. This is the benevolent maternal image of Isis. Yet Isis can also be like an Egyptian sun that beams on this lioness's head, a very dangerous goddess of destruction. She can take the form of Sekhmet and represent doom for those toward whom she feels disfavor including both mortals and immortals alike. She can be a goddess of war. So what precisely does Isis actually represent? And to whom does the solar disk actually belong? While Ra, in the form of a solitary disk, can take his place on a solar barge, he can also take the form of a blue-winged scarab beetle that lifts his solar orb off a barge into the sky. In this case, Ra can be an insect. And yet, while various references identify this mythic creature as the creator of the sun, alternative scriptural sources describe Ra as a creator of Kepra, the cosmic beetle. Or then again, the solar disk also belongs to a sun god by the name of Horus Ra, who conventionally ascends a horizon in the guise of a blue falcon, a raptor that uplifts a yellow or orange orb, much like the blue-winged scarab beetle, upon his head while rowing across the waters of the Nile. Or again, was the sun a child of a sky goddess by the name of Nut, who gives life to a solar orb from her birth canal at the beginning of each day, after which the disk is transferred onto a barge by none other than the cosmic beetle. In this scene, the solar barge does not belong solely to Ra, but to the entire pantheon of Heliopolis. Heliopolis being a Greek name for Egypt's so-called city of the sun, Heli, Heliopolis, one of the earliest historical urban centers of ancient Egypt. Members of this defined family join in with the sun god as they move in a boat over the waters of the Nile, while the sun itself follows a parallel course across the sky. At the end of the day, the sky goddess Nut will swallow the sun 
and it will pass back through her body to exit once again between her legs in due course. So there is hardly a deity that does not share some sort of mutual identity or intimate relationship with the sun. Just as the same gods will share similar biological aspects of one another, usually in the context of some mythical solar theme. And apart from these complexities, there is one particularly prominent plant symbol in Egyptian art and mythology that shares a consistently close association with Ra and the rest of various Egyptian pantheons. And that would be the blue lotus of the Nile, a water lily, whose blossoms exhibit a close resemblance to the sun. In this coffin painting, Isis supports a triad of lotus shoots with her extended wings, out of which a solar disk emerges that is identified with the bust of a goat god. And then above this disk, a goat-faced scarab beetle arises from his disk to elevate yet another solar disk, leaving all of us to wonder just who is whom and what is what. There is simply no end to the ambiguities, or what I would rather describe as the mysteries, because scholarly bewilderment need not be projected upon the cultures that had an obviously clear idea about the conventions and cryptic significance of their endemic schools of symbolic expression. A modern author on the subject of Egyptian mythology, Joyce Tildesley, sums up her scholastic opinion by stating, and I will quote, the Egyptians, happily logic-free, had no difficulty in accepting the contradictions, inconsistencies, and multiple interpretations within their stories. Just as children today see little problem in accepting the parallel stories of Santa Claus and baby Jesus as the raison d'etre for Christmas, unquote. I actually disagree with this statement. Although one of her recent publications, entitled Myths and Legends of Ancient Egypt is a very insightful read and a great place to begin exploring some of these issues. Her conclusions deviate little, however, from a famous Egyptologist at the end of the 19th century, Wallace Budge by name, who acknowledges very early on that very few specific attributes belong exclusively to any given god or goddess. More than a handful of gods and goddesses claim to be both the source and identity of all gods. Sometimes that god is known as Ra, as Atum, Nu, as Kepra, as Osiris, and many others. But these names can apply to aspects of all the gods. This is not actually an illogical premise and or a mythical construct if the notion applies to all the gods, collectively. In logic, if A equals B and B equals C and C equals D, then of course D equals both A and C. This is not happily illogical. Not at all. To quote a passage from a funerary text known as the Book of the Dead, which describes an encounter between the goddess Isis and Ra, the sun god declares, and I quote, I am the great one and the son of the great one and my father planned my name. I have multitudes of names and multitudes of forms, and my being is in every god. I have been proclaimed by the hearts of Atum and Horus. 
So the Creator is the Great One, the Father of the Great One, the Son of the Great One, essentially the embodiment of all of the gods. In one school of Egyptian mythology, one of the oldest schools that originated in Heliopolis, it so happens that the god known as Atum is usually recognized as the primeval creator of a lineage of nine gods from four divine generations. Yet the god Ra, in the same mythic tradition, also claims to be the mutual identity of each of these gods, these nine gods. Such an idea is very close to the concept of Brahman in Hindu theology of India, which most people consider to be a polytheistic tradition. Yet the famous epic myth of this Hindu tradition, the Mahabharata, states concisely, as do other Hindu doctrinal sources, that, and I'll quote, there is but one God, they're referring to Brahman, one God, which is truth's veritable self. It is from ignorance of that one God that the gods have been conceived to be diverse. That Brahmanic expression applies precisely to the Egyptian concept of deity. Wallace Budge, again, emphasizes in his pioneering interpretations of Egyptian theology, another glyphic record from the Book of the Dead, which reads, I am the great God, self-created, Nu, Nu being the God of the Nile's aquatic abyss, who made his names the company of the gods as gods, unquote. And then the inscription follows up with a rhetorical question. Then who is this? To which it offers a response. It is Ra who created names for his members. It would be for his parts, his offshoots. And these members came into being in the form of the gods, which are in the following of Ra. Thus, in this light, Perhaps one can classify Egyptian theology as a hybrid form of monotheism and polytheism. And if so, this is not an illogical construct. These theological notions are expressed wholly in a chimeric, grossly hybrid creature on a magical steel of Sippus Horus, this term referring to the childish aspect of the sun god Horus Ra, who stands upon a crocodile and exhibits here the double wings of a scarab beetle, the torso of a falcon, the legs of a human, the jovial face of the Egyptian god known as Bess, a human penis, all of which attributes are shared by divine creatures that populate the lower registers of this steel. So the gods and goddesses are but members of a singular creative entity. This being the case, I have chosen to approach our discussion on Egyptian mythology by focusing more on basic archetypal features that are employed in mythic episodes, instead of details that define the personas of mythical participants. This approach will highlight the manner in which symbolic and mythic themes apply mutually to the diverse names and roles of the gods in Egyptian mythology as a whole. And I think this will reveal, I'm hoping, a sound and consistent logic behind Egyptian religious expression. It's widely agreed that Nilotic communities and differing schools of religion over the course of 3,000 years, which disappeared a few centuries after the dawn of the Christian era, invented regionally based titles for similar divine forms to distinguish their, their own local cults, while also accepting, sometimes overtly but other times tacitly, that all gods are manifestations of a first 
and or universal creative principle. We're going to restrict, however, our investigations here to the mythic tradition of Heliopolis, or what the Egyptians refer to as the land of On, or of Anu, which pertains to the region of Egypt's great pyramids near modern Cairo. There are two good reasons for choosing this particular tradition. One being that we have a pretty complete record in writing on the details of cosmogenesis in this tradition from the walls of some of the oldest structures of ancient Egypt. And secondly, this particular myth endured in its intact form for 3,000 years of dynastic Egyptian history. Even the Greeks were familiar with the details of this narrative. Now, hieroglyphic records do not provide us with a complete and wholly intact account of any singular Egyptian myth. Rather, we uncover a vast collection of fragmentary pieces of different myths. And each of these isolated mythic fragments must be pieced together like a jigsaw puzzle to get a comprehensive perspective on ancient Egypt's mythic views on the origin of life. Archaeologists have uncovered three particularly useful literary sources to reconstruct mythic scenes, and many of them are accompanied with pictorial representations of revealing mythical snapshots, a careful collation of which provides a pretty clear picture of this early narrative. First and perhaps foremost among Egypt's written records, at least in terms of chronology and precedence, are a class of hieroglyphic inscriptions that are referred to as the pyramid texts. These writings comprise a litany of incantations, mythic narratives, and magical formulae that were inscribed on the walls, the stone walls, of early burial chambers. Hundreds of these so-called utterances describe the divine privilege and ultimate fates of kings, primarily King Unas and Teti I, whom tradition recognized as the offspring of a singular primordial creator by the name of either Atum, Tem, or Nefertum. The utterances served as instructions for the king's transformation into this creator spirit following his burial, because Egyptians believed pharaohs were destined to pass eternity in the paradisiacal fields of peace in the company of the gods on the banks of the Nile as the creator. In describing the aspect and behaviors of gods and goddesses with whom the king would would be consorting in the afterlife, or indeed becoming, we are able to construct a rather detailed profile of the Heliopolitan pantheon. We supplement information from the pyramid texts with a distinctive class of inscription that were written upon temples that housed living pharaohs, their queens, and their associates. Inscriptions on the outer walls of palaces and temples were traditionally covered with records of the king's pedigree and historical accomplishments, often in terms of his military prowess. These messages were exhibited in full view of the public, even though few, if any, commoners were able to read them. No doubt the literate sectors of the society were able to read the script for the masses, largely one would presume, for the sake of propaganda. These historical sources have limited relevance, however, to the present discussion. On the other hand, we do encounter writings on the walls of the inner sancti of these temples, which do include quite useful references on Egyptian mythology, mostly in the form of hymns to the gods and descriptions of ritual methods. 
Traditional access to these records were apparently limited to the king and his closest of associates. A second important source of mythic materials comes from a class of literature called the coffin texts. These inscriptions are found on wooden coffins and stone sarcophagi of individuals that came from all walks of Egyptian life. Linguists refer to these inscriptions as spells, but they comprise a complex canon of religious expression that covers a gamut of subjects relating to mythology and the transformation and or passage of a body and soul to the realm of the gods. These inscriptions are almost always accompanied by elaborate and colorful illustrations, most of which are mythic in character and therefore provide a fantastic source of insight into beliefs and ritual practices of the Egyptians. Within these same coffins, excavators occasionally extract a manuscript made from papyrus paper. These books were prepared for and purchased by aristocrats as grave offerings to themselves, grave offerings that accompanied the deceased as a guide to the land of the gods. Their subject matter generally covers the same ground as the coffin texts, and usually include pen drawings and colorful illustrations that relate to the chapters. Each chapter can vary considerably in size and subject matter, some relating to mythic themes, others to the process by which the gods judge a soul, or instructions for a deceased person to board the boat of Ra to enter the god's proverbial field of blessings. Although each chapter of this book was copied faithfully by generations of scribes, the number and selection of chapters can vary between individual books, all of which we currently refer to as the Book of the Dead. In the 42nd chapter of the Book of the Dead, from what's known as the Papyrus of Nu, it is made clear that members of the Egyptian pantheon were mere incarnations of one another, each representing an aspect of the first principle that set life in motion. To quote this chapter from the Papyrus of Nu, I am Ra, my face is the face of the disc, my eyes are the eyes of Hathor, my neck is the neck of the divine goddess Isis, my phallus is the phallus of Osiris, my belly and back are the belly and back of Sekhet, my buttocks are the buttocks of the eye of Horus, my hips and legs are the hips and legs of Nut. There is no member of my body which is not the member of some god. For I am the Lord of eternity, and I decree and I judge, like the scarab god, Kepra. I am he who dwells in the eye of Horus and in the egg, and it is given unto me to live within them all. So, the traditional conflation of Ra's cosmic being with a host of mythic players that we shall now explore in more depth, namely Kepra, the scarab beetle, Osiris, an underworld phallic figure, Horus, the falcon-headed son of Osiris, and a list of other creative spirits, implies that the sun god Ra lives forever by means of his divine descendants just as they live eternally as a manifestation of him. Now, it's a little challenging for curious readers and art connoisseurs to wrap their imaginative heads around the notion of a solar orb assuming biological features. And yet the same papyrus that we just quoted makes one last assertion that equates the identity of Ra with a plant form which naturally has biological features. 
and which we shall soon see is the one and only plant in Egypt that monopolizes a mystical role in mythology and the visual arts. And that is the blue lotus, observed in this exquisite pectoral of the famous King Tutankhamun. And I quote from the papyrus of Nu. Verily I say unto you, I, Ra, am the sprout which comes forth from the abyssal waters of Nu. And my mother is Nut, the sky. Hail, O creator. Hail, O egg. Hail, O egg. I am Horus. He now lives for millions of years. His flame shines upon you and brings your hearts to me. This passage infers that the sun is a sprout that moves from the waters of the Nile into the sky. Both Ra and his divine offspring are said to sprout from the animalian concept of an egg. And that egg is a solar disk that arises from the Nile's waters into the sky. Here identified as the mother of the discoid sprout so I am arguing in this episode on Paradise Earth that written extracts of this type identify the Nilotic Lotus as a living manifestation of Egypt's sun. And, moreover, that modern scholarship has missed the boat in recognizing that Egyptian art and mythology refers more frequently to the flower than it does to the sun in the sky. To make my case, we will be focusing almost exclusively on the mythic traditions of Heliopolis, with particular focus on what might be called the Osiris Horus cycle, the Osirian cycle of this epic tale, because this particular storyline enjoyed more currency and popularity in Egyptian history than any other. The Heliopolitan perspective on creation was preserved faithfully during the first 3,000 years of written history. In brief, the myth begins with the appearance of a masculine god by the name of Atum, who assumes in our earliest records of the myth three symbolically related forms. He appears as a lotus stalk, in which case he goes by the name of Nefertum or he is described as a lone phallus, sometimes under the name of Ra, as well as Atum. And also, he appears as a blue-winged scarab beetle by the name of Kepera, or Kepri. Atum's cosmic seed of creation that emanates from the flower, from the phallus, and the beetle gives birth to three succeeding generations of divine beings, comprising nine gods and goddesses that are referred to collectively as the Ennead, the Ninesome. The last generation of the Ennead, which involves two brothers and two sisters, namely Osiris, Seth, Isis, and Nephthys, established the perpetuation of cycles of life and death on earth. The two brothers, Seth and Osiris, vie for power over Nefertum's blissful field of reeds. This results in a daily drama of fratricide and necromancy, in which Seth, the envious brother of Osiris, drowns his brother on the banks of the Nile River and chops his brother's body into many pieces. Not a very nice brother. This compels his sister, Isis, to seek out the lifeless and dismembered pieces of Osiris uh, with special interest in reclaiming her brother's missing phallus. Isis eventually couples with the fallen phallus and joyfully conceives her one and only son, Horus, who as a blue falcon or blue water lily, returns the cosmic seed of his father, Osiris Ra, in the form of a divine sort of watery efflux from 
Horace's solar eye to his father's phallus. In doing so, Horace immortalizes his father and thus immortalizes his own biological source. This creative act, resulting from a destructive act, establishes the cyclic nature of life on the banks of the Nile. And, in effect, the interactive roles of Horus and Osiris recapitulate the primordial act of their primeval creator, Nefertum, in that they resurrect a cosmic phallic lotus stalk at the dawning of each day. Now, at the ancient site of Dindera, which endured throughout pharaonic Egyptian history, we observe various members of the Ennead approaching the Eye of Horus, whose image, within a mirror, reflects the identities of the entire pantheon. No primary hieroglyphic source summarizes this narrative in detail, even though several extended threads in the coffin texts and the pyramid texts come pretty close. We do have, however, an authentic Greek record of the tale that was penned around the turn of the century. And this record does tell the tale in its complete form. 